the title of what I want to teach. It's called Above the Law. It's called Above the Law, and before I teach it, there are certain disclaimers I need to give. This sermon is completely useless to you if you've not accepted, mastered, and used the basics of the teachings of love. The basics of the teachings of love, as you know, begin number one with forgiveness, go number two to generosity, and then patience and the rest. The reason why I say this caveat, it's because if you attempt to live the life that I'm about to teach, when love and its principles for you are not a given, then you will end up very confused and in a lot of trouble. Here's how I mean. For four plus years, we have taught the basics of the kingdom. We've taught kindergarten for four years. What is kindergarten? Forgive your enemy, love your enemy. Kindergarten is be generous. Do not worship resources. Be a responsible member of your fellowship. Ensure that if you are eating, there is no one in your fellowship going hungry. Now, these are the basics of the kingdom. Uh, to emphasize further the basics of the kingdom, there's a scripture I shared in Luke, and I'd never seen it before, but I shared it on my Facebook. And the story goes something like this. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he instructs his disciples to go ahead of him to a village in Samaria that they should allow him passage. Okay? And the village says, by the way, sort of, we have no idea who you are. We will not grant you passage. Now, like a typical modern day charismatic preacher, uh, Peter and John and the disciples come back to him and they say, will you send fire from heaven like Elijah did to consume this town? And Jesus says something that for me flipped a switch in my head. He says, don't you know what kind of spirit you have? In other words, what Jesus was saying was, don't you understand that we are no longer in the dispensation for which we punished those who wronged us by using the powers God has given us? Okay? Now, typically, our Christian experience has been that if the devil has sent fire through your neighbor, you spend the whole night sending fire back. Correct? And, and, and that kind of thinking is still quite prevalent in Christian thought today. But for the purposes of this lesson, you must have left that thinking behind. You must be an instrument of mercy, an instrument of forgiveness, an instrument of love for you to be able to live through the life that I'm about to describe. If you do not have those principles, moving forward it will be difficult for you to live through what God is teaching. It's a good preamble. Okay? All right. 
Now, one of my favorite scriptures in the book of Romans, it says something interesting. And it says, uh, Christ is the limit at which the law ends, where it ceases to exist. Correct? Now, I've taught this many times, but I want you to ask yourself the question that outside the law, then what is it that exists? Right? It's a basic question. If you've been freed from the law, how then do you live life? If in Kenya we removed our constitution and our penal code, what then would guide what we do? Correct? Now, because many Christians did not understand and do not understand to date how to live a life where the law is not the basis upon which you are judged for being right or wrong, what they did is they built a dichotomy. And they said, those who are breakers of the law are against God, and those who are keepers of the law are pro-God. See, that's how we usually do it. Correct? Now, the problem with that is this, that if you keep the law and you break the law, you both have the same thing in common, the law. You're both under the law. <laughs> See, that's the truth. Now, the problem, again, with being under the law and trying to be a goody two-shoes, the only thing you actually achieve is becoming an excellent secret keeper. Because you soon discover that you are a lying, masturbating, porn-watching... <laughs> No, that's what happens. And then what you do is you become an excellent liar. So your prayer closet is full of repentance. Oh God, I shall not touch the letter P on my keyboard again. No, it's P for Pornhub. <laughs> no, it's P for Pornhub. You know? And the funniest thing is you stop touching the letter P, then you discover there are many other letters that can describe the same thing. And you discover that those, both those who try to find righteousness, righteousness by keeping the law, and those who actively pursue breaking it, end up at the same place where they've broken it. Are we together? And therefore it says in the Old Testament, that every other sin, its penalty is death. Correct? You still die. You adulterate, die. You, you know, everything is death, right? You wonder how there were millions of Jews by the time Jesus was coming. It's because if you read your Bible carefully, they didn't stone very many people. Because they soon realized, I... <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, read your Bible. You'll discover there were very few people who were stoned. And in fact, most of the time, God needed someone killed. He had to do it himself. Or when he opened the ground to swallow them, hadn't he already given them the law? Right? But if you read, if you apply the law in its system, I'm telling you, there is no one left in Israel. Who is left? Whether there would be no Jesus because David would have died. <laughs> you understand? But what happens in the modern church today is because we left the law, then you step a few steps into Christianity and then you realize they didn't tell you what to do outside the law. So what do people do? They revert to the law, and then we choose within the law. 
we decide pigs, pigs, pigs are fine. Pigs are fine. Shrimp, shrimp is fine. Shrimp is fine. Gayness, no, 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 that one, no, no. It is unnatural. <laughs> so we, we, we choose the laws that we feel are important, you know, as though God had like a grading system, yeah, his laws, this one is worth more. You know, in churches today, you can go and say, I used to be a thief last week, I robbed a bank, but I have repented, right? You go to church and say you committed adultery a week ago and you've repented. Because, again, we do not know how to live beyond the law. So now I want to show you, as Jesus would call it, a more excellent path. That path is hidden in what Peter and Jesus called us. Peter called us a royal priesthood. Number one, if you are a royal, if you are a king, are you subject to the laws of the land? Yeah? Are you subject to the law of the land? Guys, if you are a king, are you subject to the law of the land? No. Okay. So question, if you are a royal, are you subject to the law? Okay. Let me ask it another way. Is God subject to the law? No. Now I'm just starting. Is God subject to the law? Does God obey the law? Does God keep the Sabbath day? <laughs> you see, the reason why that question throws you off is because you know God is righteous and holy, but the only way you know righteous and holy is by keeping the law. So it becomes a logical quagmire in your head. You're like, okay. So you can imagine God does not have any other God but God. <laughs> right? So but by the fact of his Godhead and the fact of his kingship, we know he cannot be subject to the law. Okay? In other words, you cannot uh, prosecute a sitting head of state. Can you? You can't. And the reason you can't is because the president is the only person in the nation who has monopoly of violence? Yes. He's the only person who can say, by the way, go across the border and twanga some people. And he will not be arrested. Okay? Right? The police are part of the executive. So when you demonstrate and over demonstrate, and a policeman hits you, you can't take him to court unless you can demonstrate you are not guilty. Correct? So the head of state has monopoly of violence. Oh, okay. You don't believe me. Okay. God in, in Exodus has a rule. Do not kill. Uh -huh. How many people does he kill in Exodus? Himself. Do you understand? So the head of state cannot be subject to the same laws as you and I. Okay, let me ask you a question. Al-Shabaab attacks Westgate. Okay, what was the president's order? 
arrest nicely and bring them. The order you shoot to kill. Now you try giving that order, Mr. Not Head of State. <laughs> You, you, you begin to understand that that which is royal does not live according to the laws, I'm sorry for this word, of the common folk. And this is just the reality. Isn't it? Now, if we are joint heirs with Christ. Okay? If we rule with him, if we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, then aren't you above the law? Now, I just want to know. Uh, is my logic correct or incorrect? To go same was up. To go signal. Yeah. You see, immediately you think about it that way, then your definition of what is righteous and what constitutes being right before God changes. So since you were called into a royal priesthood, the question you must immediately ask yourself is what then are the rules that guide the ruling class? Let me pause. Stick a pin in it. Wait for me there. All right. How many of you are God's ambassadors? Show of hands. Not, not show of muscles. <laughs> show of hands. <laughs> okay, lift your hand if you are a God. It's a problem of teaching people freedom. So you just lift your hand, please. I want, right? Okay? So if you are God's ambassador, then that tells me that you also have diplomatic immunity. No, <laughs> <laughs> See, it means you have diplomatic immunity. It means the law of the land within which you sojourn do not necessarily apply to you. Correct? And even if you were to do a mistake, for them to arrest you, they need to go through diplomatic channels. Correct? And if your home state so decides, they can send a plane and fly you out and they won't touch you. Correct? Mm -hmm. Even if you've done something wrong. Julian Assange was in the Estonian embassy, it was. Okay, I think it was. For how many years? Only when the Estonians were tired of him was he arrestable. So, you are a king, you are an ambassador. Let us look at another category you, follow, you fall in. You are a priest, correct? All right. So as a priest, when people couldn't eat the bread in the Holy of Holies, could you? When people couldn't approach God, could you? When people couldn't touch the sacred things, could you? So by every definition, you, by virtue of being one with Christ, are above the law. 
And unlike a president whose term ends and then you can impeach him, you cannot impeach a king. Much less an eternal king. the clause of how many MPs are needed to impeach God. <laughs> now, in Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. Tukwapo? Eh? It says, No soldier, when in service, gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him. Now, I want us to think carefully about the words there used. A lot of how we take Christianity if you are a soldier, you would think that God is most pleased with the soldier with the shiniest boots, <laughs> the cleanest uniform. That's how we take righteousness, right? But remember, this is not a soldier in barracks. It's a soldier in service, correct? So if you are going to give a soldier marks, what would you give him max for? For achieving the task you sent him or for how clean he is? For the task, correct? Okay. Let us look at the next verse and what Paul says. Paul says, verse 5, and if anyone enters into competitive games, he's not crowned unless he competes lawfully, right? according to the rules laid down, unless he competes. Not when he is looking the most athletic. He has to run. He has to compete, correct? It is the hardworking farmer who labors to produce who must be the partaker of the... Okay? Now... The farmer who labors to produce, how clean does the farmer look? Have you ever found a clean farmer? Verse 7. Think over these things I'm saying. Understand them and grasp their application. For the Lord will grant you full insight and understanding in everything. Now, no soldier when in service gets entangled in civilian life. It's a stark contrast. The example here you need to understand is that the laws of a soldier are different from the laws of a civilian. Soldiers have martial law, correct? And they Police, when they arrest a soldier, they have to call the military police, correct? Okay. Now, if you are a soldier in the... You are a... Keep going. Oh, in the... Okay. Why do you live according to civilian laws and civilian enterprise. You must understand that there must be a fundamental change in how you consider yourself and your occupation and position in this world. And therefore, Jesus put it like this. I sent you into the world, but you're not of the world. 
you are not of the world. Now, a lot of Christians drew a dichotomy like this, if you're like me. Me, I knew the club called, uh, what is Dimples. Yeah. I like the way you knew exactly which one it is. Me, I drew a Dimpale, as we used to call it, was the world, and behind it, Nakuru Chapel, was not being of the world. That was my dichotomy. But the dichotomy is not in keeping or breaking the law because the result of both is the same. So we must find what is that which that makes me not of the world. Sindio? Romans chapter 7, verse 4. And where is time going? <laughs> Likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death as to the law through the crucified body of Christ. Okay? So you've died to the law. So you can't know English. You have died to the law. So that now you may belong to another. Now that's not English. You've died to the law, and now you belong to another. <laughs> that's strange, right? I might make sense to you. Because if you died to the law, the next answer must be, Either you are lawless, or here is a new law. But the answer says you belong. So the first principle of being above the law, first law you must keep in being above the law, if that makes sense, is the understanding that you belong to another. You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to your ideas. You don't belong to your concept of life you belong. Let me continue. It will come together if God opens your eyes. <laughs> Listen. To him who was raised from the dead in order in order <laughs> okay i want you to think about it you left the law most of us got born again to keep the law which is why you sang the things i used to do i don't do them and you're just lying <laughs> you, 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 you just didn't do them in public. You know, like Mugzo. As, as they will be. You know, Nikavula Ule Beshtako, I'll switch off, switch on the lights, like some brother Mugan. You know, Mugan was singing in the dark. Then an accident happened and the lights needed to be switched on. Wakukutana hapo wako watu more than one kutoka CU. Eh, kanisa iko hapo. Sorry, let me just say this joke. You know those guys? <laughs> those guys who, when I was in Campo, eh? So you could never go to the club eh? where near the town where you're, you're, you're from, eh? So these guys used to go, manzi unenda ku club Meru. So you happy. So there's this uh, Christian celeb. He was telling me how he'd, he'd gone to Samuko. Yeah, this town's like Tarakanithi. You know, some, <laughs> some nondescript town. Eh? Eh, Allah <laughs> Fakaskia, Pastor, Pio Koab. 
<laughs> you know, because our understanding of being born again was, I am not doing those things. And I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination whether you should or should not go to a club. That's introduction of a law. But I want you to understand something. To him who was raised from the dead, and this is now the resurrection life I was talking about, in order that what may happen, that we may bear fruit. Okay. So the definition of being above the law is what? It is productivity. It is not goodness, niceness. It is productivity. In other words, if you are not productive, then you have forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past. The proof positive of whether God is happy with you is a strange thing. Because I have never read in my Bible where God said to anyone, look, very righteous servant. Ever heard that? Have you ever God, heard God say, your holiness? But what does he say? He says, good and faithful servant. What is a good and faithful servant? It is a servant from whom you expect that tasks given to them have been accomplished. Are we together? It is the only compliment that is pervasive in the Bible, consistently. Now, if you want to understand David and Abraham and anyone, including Moses, you see, if Moses was in church today and he died, and then his children from a strange Ethiopian woman showed up at the funeral, all of you people would say, Aki Jamal Kwanga pretender. Al Tukazia. See, Moses is the one who gave them the law. That you shall not marry from those tribes. Right? <laughs> it's the reason why people have serious problems with David. You can you imagine if Billy came to class and he said how the other Billy is not coming to class anymore because he had to have him killed so that he could marry his wife. <laughs> no, just, just, I just want you to imagine. <laughs> You get Ati Tunakuja class Munaliza Mugzo Akoapi Niliambia Hez Wakikula lunch Ike ka spice Now can you imagine after that statement God saying the throne of David will be established forever? But it's because we miss one thing about David. David was the guy who God would say, kill all the Amalekites. He would kill even their cockroaches. In other words, if you look at everyone God loved, including Jesus, 
it is because every instruction God gave them was done. Every instruction. Listen, Aaron, Miriam, they could hear God, right? And they were prophets, correct? But why do you think God chose Moses in that small scaffold they had over Miriam and Aaron? By God's own law, by the way, who was wrong? Moses was the one who was wrong. But who was the meekest servant? It was Moses. Yeah? He says so himself. <laughs> now, I want us to consider carefully your business or your shamba. I want you to imagine you've got three servants. Okay? One guy smokes weed in the morning, limas three acres by himself, never complains. Whatever you pay him, he is happy. Another guy does not smoke, does not drink, you get. Limas exactly the acres you told him, he's got a target of half an acre. Every day he does half an acre. You get. Which of those two servants will you love more? Just one get two In fact, in fact, if we are honest, you'll start suggesting to the guy of, of half an acre. <laughs> Now, before you write me saying I'm advocating for Bangi, I don't give laws. <laughs> Never. So if, I'm not, if I say yes, I'm giving you a law. If I say no, I'm giving you a law. So I don't do those things. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> but <laughs> I want you to understand, and this is critical, that there is something about productivity. If you are productive, you have less time being stupid. So even the mistakes that you would make when you're busy doing God's work reduce 6 million percent. Therefore, the answer to how you live above the law has got to be answered by how fruitful are you. Now, fruitfulness is not a cacon game you can do with God. It is not like your KCPE examination, where you can go to your parents and say, Nilipata B+. Plus. And B plus is above average, so your parents would be happy, right? But you, you know you didn't read as hard. You know you could have gotten an A. But you see, the problem with this fruitfulness is you're talking to the person who made you. So he knows what you're capable of. So when you go to him with your B minus, and he knows he made an A material, do you think Ah. Should I give you an example of a guy who gave a B minus? There's a guy called Saul. Remember him? Saul goes to war. And the instruction is what? Kill everything. What does Saul do? He scored 98%. He left a few sheep, a few people alive. That is where the statement that obedience is better than witchcraft comes from. It's better than sacrifice. And the sin of disobedience is as the sin of 
witchcraft. So my dear friends, when you score 98% of what God expected you to deliver, where when Akarumanzira the witch, same was up. Sitafute mganga, jiangalie kwa kio. Listen, sin of disobedience is as the sin of when Saul did not deliver everything he had promised God. Can you imagine if there were 30 guys, he just left two, and the kingdom was taken from him? Now, I want you to consider your life and ask the question, how fruitful are you? Because this is the new law you must apply in your life. Now, why is this the law that is applicable to you? It is applicable to you because the reason why royalty is exempt from the law is because it is expected, and Samita told you, that the actions of royalty is what is good for the community. It is expected that if the president okays that some guy is killed by a drone strike, he is doing it for the betterment of the nation. But now here you are, Oh, president, with your nicely polished shoes, with your nice clean reputation, and there is no fruit. There is nothing changing in your environment. Nothing is getting better. That, my friend, is the only thing in the entirety of the New Testament that can get you cut off from God. I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. When he finds you with the fruit, he prunes you so that you may bear. But any branch that is found without fruit, it shall be cut off and shall be burnt. It did not say any branch that passed through club dimples. It did not say any branch that does not wear these long flowing or fashion dresses says any branch that does not bear fruit. And so we are called to a new dimension of living. That dimension is called profitability. And therefore Paul put it like this, all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. And therefore, the question you must ask yourself, of what profit are you? you, 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 you. I was discussing with my friend, Miss Haso Hasamita, yesterday it was, feels like, a week I've had such a busy day. And, and, and she was getting into this business partnership. She kept telling me how her partner is nice, has a nice smile, is hardworking, you know, all of those things. <laughs> then I asked her a question, have they brought you a profit? If your partnership with someone, <laughs> 
cannot be quantified in profitability, what's the use? That's the bottom line, isn't it? Uh, similarly, God, what does he call it? Call us. We are partners in his work, correct? Now, partners are not partners to get work done. Partners are partners to profit. Isn't it? Now, your union with God, your union with the fellowship called Masterclass, of what profit are you? Tukikuona kwa get unakam. Tunafanya hesabu ya minus ama plus. Kani mluye kaa sisi tuhesabu ugali minus. Nyama minus. Kuku negative. What? what? Let me tell you. When you walk into an environment, do people see an addition, an irritation, or amusement for two seconds? Ukona jokes poor. Let me just ask. Because most Christians are irritating. You hire a Christian. They sit in your company for a month. You are trying to make your bottom lines work. During the meeting, staff meeting, they raise their hand, call you nice names, boss. You know, I thank God for you all the time. You are a man really blessed of God. And all that nonsense. And then they tell you, I think to turn this business around, we need a lunchtime fellowship. Do it Clients will come and go like, oh, you have a lifetime fellowship. I trust you. Here's my money. We call you with a problem. Don't worry, I will pray. Who, who the heck told you we can't pray? Kabla tukupigi ula fikiria tu kwa tumuangia na God. When you are above the law, you're above the law because you're fruitful. Because there is production. Above the law is not about hurry. You understand? So it's like, whew, yo, mazi. We always wanted to go to the club. So tonight, Mark, I'll say, Makuna law. It's foolishness. You are above the law to be fruitful, to produce. And this is how you know you've produced. You ask yourself a simple question. What has God told you to do that is presently on the earth? Ama. You are a witch. Now, notice something. Verse 5. When we were living in the flesh, mere physical lives, the sinful passions that were awakened and aroused by what the law makes sin were constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs and our sensitive appetites of the flesh so that we bore fruit for death. Does it make sense? But let me explain bearing fruit for death. When you're still selfish, you can't forgive, you can't give. Okay? 
That means, very basic example, let's say this is person X. They're hungry. I am still unloving, I'm still uncaring. I didn't give him, correct? What fruit am I having? Death, correct? Let me tell you something. The letter kills, you know that, correct? Okay. Have you ever noticed that most of the most righteous people you know are also the most murderous people you know? Especially when it comes to rumors, It comes to holding grudges. <laughs> Let me explain to you why. There is no one more jealous than the elder brother who wants to go to a party and can't go. Then you dare go to a party and God does not punish you. Wait, wait, wait. Mtu ukach. Haya kuangaliani. Mimi nimekaa hapa nimejikazia. Wewe umeenda ukahanya hanya. God this son of yours. Anytime you find yourself jealous of a free, the freedom of another. Just know you are a murderer. It is the reason why people would stone in 2021 a gay couple. We ask them, was your butt used in any way? Your anal sphincter is completely okay. Why you are drinking Panadol for another person's headache? I don't understand. But it is because you, in your heart, you have desires and taboos. You want things done to your nether regions that other people can do. And because all mekaziwa, you become a murderer. So what am I balancing here? I'm balancing here and telling you that both... <laughs> Bunny, what are you doing? <laughs> Bunny has become that guy from Uganda. You see, you need to understand something. Whether you are a breaker of the law or you are a keeper of the law, the answer for both of you is death. Because it is impossible to keep it. And therefore, what people don't understand is the more you try to keep the law, the more you arouse the sinful nature. It's very simple. My friend, you try this. Try having money like 10 Gs in your pocket at lunchtime in Nairobi. Utapeta kenchi, kai ainuki, java, you can't smell anything. You pita next to a mamamboga, she's cooking, can't smell anything. You pita the same street, na hauna pesa umibaki na cafe ya pekeaki. You smell everything. Me, there was a time I was so broke, skumawiki smelled nice. Nata ikuwe meko wa kitunguna nyanya, that's the season. Wewe wa skuma inekonga, kshh. Like, oh, that skuma smells nice. And you see the funniest thing about trying to keep the law, it just migrates into your mind. Inaingia hibernation mode. Na kukumbushanga midnight. You remember me? <laughs> so you are above it. And how do you rise above it? You rise above it by becoming fruitful. Anything outside of that, you keep bearing fruit for death. And then what begins to happen? Your relationships begin to die. 
Now listen, but now we're discharged from the law and have terminated, terminated. Um, I like the word used here. All intercourse, having died to what once restrained and held us captive. So now we serve not under obedience of the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the spirit in the newness of life. Uh -huh. So I like the juxtaposition that Paul is putting before us. He is saying, death to the law is being alive to the promptings of the spirit, to the instructions of the spirit. A lot of the time why Christians say they cannot hear God is because they listen to him for consolation. They want to go to God and say, by the way, my life is very hard and I am currently very sad. I have a thing called a landlord, another called a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and another called I don't have money. Lord, please speak to me. Yet the promptings of the Spirit are driven by the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, you must be loving, patient, kind before God can talk to you. You must already be generous before God can talk to you. You must already be forgiving before God can talk to you. Because in that process, you've become a conduit of God's love and not a reservoir of bitterness. Because God does not prompt you to yourself. It's only you Pentecostals who God speaks to for you. Hey, God and Niambia, it's going to be okay. Dude, when was it not going to be okay? He's God. God and Niambia, ni hold on. Because uh -huh. let go of life. Hey. God, the promptings, you know what a prompt is? A prompt is something that initiates an action. Here's his nodding because it's an IT term. And I tell you, I'll prompt you. It is expected that after the prompt, there is action. Now, if you are the kind of person who's, who call, you know, those people for the, the, the road, the seed on the road, God told you you forgot. You know, you are the only one who it says that demons come and pick. You are very good friends. Demons are just hanging out on your bedroom door. King Goja. God damn it, Mombia Nini. I'm a sahau or sahau. You forgot. I want to hide under a rock. Or the other type, it is hard. Like, what do you want to be known for? Here lies Tabitha. She did easy stuff. She never saw a battle she couldn't run away from. <laughs> Can you imagine your movie? Eh? Movie starts with you running away. <laughs> Climax, you running away. <laughs> then there's the third category. I got distracted. I got distracted. Again, my conversation with her. Oh, so I was going to, and then I don't know what happened. I'm thinking, yeah, okay. All those are the enemies you have to fruitfulness.